friends and I'm really delighted also for the mix of humans who are in the audience. So my name is Eva Fisher, for those of you who don't know, and I am relatively new faculty, as Danny said. So I started in August 2020, so right in the middle of the pandemic. So it's been an interesting time to start a job. Um, and kind of as being relatively new, the fallout of that is that a lot of what I'm going to talk about today um, is things I did before I arrived to the U of I as a postdoc. Um, but then there's a little bit of data at the end that uh, is from my lab. And so I know this is a general audience, and so, um, but I really want to take you along for the science that we're doing in my lab. Uh, so there will be science. There are a couple of graphs. Get ready. Um, but I also please like super encourage people, like interrupt me, put something in the chat, put up a hand. Um, Danny, if someone's doing something and I don't see it, please alert me because if this were in person, um, not as many people from far away would be here, but it would also be more interactive. So pros and cons here. Um, so the first thing I want to do is thank the members of my current lab who are the best part of my day. Um, like the best part of my job is that I now feel like I just get to cheerlead the, the people in my lab who are really the ones doing awesome science. And so, like I said, the lab is relatively new. So like we have little bits of data coming out, but it's super exciting to see things growing and things coming. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge the members of the O'Connell lab, which is where I was a postdoc and which is where a lot of this work was done. And a lot of these ideas kind of came from. All right, so we're gonna start really broadly um, with the fact that, so one of the things that initially I like drew me to science was the fact that, and specifically to behavior, is that if we look at different kinds of animals, we can see that they still exhibit really similar kinds of behaviors. So mating and, or aggressive kinds of behaviors, mating and courtship kinds of behaviors, and parental and affiliative kinds of behaviors, right? So there's these kind of broad scale similarities. But at the same time, there's obviously tons of diversity here in how exactly animals perform these behaviors, what kind of adaptations they have to be able to perform them, and what kind of cues they're using to decide when and if to perform them. And so for me, this kind of like push pull between these similarities on the one hand and like these differences or this diversity on the other hand, always just naturally led me to wonder like, what's going on under the hood? Does evolution reuse the same building blocks when we build different kinds of traits? And so, like I said, I'm particularly interested in behavior, but this is actually a question we can think about for all sorts of traits. So this is a really broad biological question. When I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about it in the context of behavior. And so specifically, like another way of kind of saying this is are similar behaviors controlled by the same underlying mechanisms? So this is this question of like, okay, they look kind of the same, but what's going on under the hood? Is it the same genes, the same molecules, the same brain regions? How are we building these behaviors? And so given we're talking about behavior, we have to talk about the brain. So here is a um, randomly chosen organism. Um, and this is a brain. A friend of mine just pointed out to me like, oh, I couldn't tell what that was. It just looked like a blob. It is a brain, it is a frog brain. Um, and you can immediately, I think, appreciate that brains have some three-dimensional structures. So there's some like lobes back here that stick out. We also um, can identify brain regions inside of brains. So I'm using these blobs here to show you that. Um, and these different brain regions, what's interesting about them is that we can identify them across individuals and also in some cases across species. So that's something we'll come back to. Inside of those brain regions are different kinds of cells that are talking to each other. So there's some networks that are forming. Um, and those networks are made up of neurons, which are highly specialized cells, both in the way that they look and the way that they communicate with one another. And then something that has really changed for biologists in the last like 15 or 20 years is our ability to also zoom in um, on all the way down to like individual neurons in the brain or anywhere really and ask like, what are the genes that are being expressed in these neurons? So sort of getting all the way down to this level of the single gene. 
And so something that I think has been special about behavior and about brains is that we have these like hierarchical levels of organization. And so we can think about where behavior comes from at these different levels. Um, and in my lab, we also try to think about how things happen across these levels. So, right, think like behavior is complex. And so we can identify genes important for behavior, but it's not like one gene makes one behavior. It's much more complex than that. And part of the reason is that things are comp like happening across these levels and there's all sorts of interactions. And so we're trying to like be able to tease that apart. That's sort of one of our goals. The other thing about behavior that I think is special is that it changes on really different timescales. So we can think about behavior like immediately changing, right? Animals making decisions right now and like flailing my arms around while I talk. We can also think about how development influences behavior. So experiences um, while animals are young influence, have lifelong consequences for behavior. Um, and that can go across generations. So the way you were parented influences the way you later parent. Um, and then we can also zoom out even further and think about patterns across evolutionary comparisons. So why do some species do it one way and some species do it another way? And so the other thing, again, that I think is special here is that there's this question of time and different time scales. And so these are kind of like two things that in our lab, we try to hold in our minds as we approach these questions. And so what I'm going to tell you about today um, is I'm going to introduce you to the frogs that we have mostly been working on. And then we're going to talk about parental care. And then we're going to talk a bit about individual variation. Okay, so let's talk about the frogs. Here they are looking grouchy, but they're really very sweet. Um, so mostly we have worked on South American poison frogs and the family Dendrobatidae. And there are three kind of characteristics that we talk about as, as unifying this group. The first, as the name implies, is that they have defensive chemicals. These are small molecule alkaloids. Um, they don't actually make their toxins themselves. They get them from their diet. Um, they specialize on ants and mites. Um, and so we actually also think that those ants aren't making the toxins, but they're getting them from the plants. So there's kind of some interesting up of the food chain processes happening here. But these frogs can eat a bunch of these ants and kind of harvest those chemicals and they store them in their skin and then they can release them. And this is pretty defensive. So it's not like they attack you. They're using it to not get eaten because they um, will make animals sick or in some cases, like animals, including humans, would just die if they ate one. And so to advertise this, that they are toxic and you should leave them alone, they also have this lovely warning, or this is also called aposematic coloration. And so this is one of the reasons people have often encountered these at an aquarium or a zoo or a pet shop, is that they're really very like striking looking. They come in all sorts of colors, um, and they're using that color to advertise their toxicity. What people tend to be less aware of is that they also have evolved elaborate forms of parental behavior. And so this is what we primarily have worked on in my lab or what I have primarily worked on, but there's also some pretty interesting connections between these different traits that, um, yeah, we think about and I'm happy to chat about. All right, so we're talking about poison frog parenting. So what does it actually look like to be a parent if you are a poison frog? There's three, kind of typical behaviors that we talk about. The first is egg attendance. So all of these animals, so most of you are probably familiar with North American frogs. Some of you I know are very familiar with North American frogs. Most of these frogs lay their eggs in water. They lay a gajillion eggs and they're like, peace out. It's been real, good luck to you and they leave. Our guys lay their eggs on land. And so they have to clean them, they hydrate them, they actively defend them from predators. But when these little eggs hatch and the tadpoles come out of there, those tadpoles still need to be in water. So phase two of parental care is what we call tadpole transport. And so this is in this case, dad, and this is a tadpole. I know it's probably a little hard to see on his back. Um, and so what they do is that they carry their tadpoles piggyback style to pools of water where those tadpoles stay until they metamorphose. And then in some species, though not all of them, we have this third interesting behavior, which we call egg provisioning or also nursing, where moms will, in this case, come back, visit their tadpoles and feed them unfertilized eggs all the way through development. And so 
I know this doesn't look like nursing in a mammal, but we use the term nursing because something we think is a really interesting parallel here is that these animals are making something with their own bodies. So they're not going out and finding food and bringing it the way we like imagine a bird bringing a worm. They're actually producing something from inside of themselves. And we think this has some other interesting consequences. Okay, so right, we talked about how many frogs don't do this. Most frogs don't do this. It's only like 10% of frogs that provide any parental care. So like, why do it, right? Everybody else is saving a lot of time and energy. The parents in the room are like, that would have been a nicer way, like not stuck with you for 18 years. My parents are here, so they know. Um, longer than 18 years in their case, can't get rid of me. Um, in any case, why do this, right? Like what's the benefit of this costly behavior? And so, Within um, our frogs, they all lay their eggs terrestrially. And we think this is because the place where your eggs are most likely to get eaten is in the water. So if you can get them out of there, you're increasing their chances of survival. So that's like phase one. And then we think the other thing that's important here is that there's this relationship between less care on the one hand and more resources and more care on the other hand and fewer resources. So at this end of the spectrum, we have frogs that put their tadpoles in relatively larger pools. There's often other tadpoles in there. So there's competition, there's some predation. Um, these guys also tend to carry their tadpoles many at a time. So this is again, dad and these lumpy looking things are a bunch of tadpoles on his back. As we move across this continuum, we see the use of smaller pools. This is a palm bract, so they fill up with water and our guys like to put tadpoles in there. Um, and they carry their tadpoles like one or fewer at a time. At the extreme, they put them in these tiny, really awesome individual condos. So if you imagine a bromeliad or like, if you're not sure what a bromeliad looks like, like the top of a pineapple, the places where the leaves meet fill up with water and they put their tadpoles in there. And this is awesome because it is super safe. Um, there is no competition. There is also no food. And so we think it's at this extreme that then this egg provisioning evolves. So it's like, okay, now I made you really safe, but now I have to solve this problem of there not being any food. Um, and so the moms come back and feed their tadpoles. So this is kind of this general relationship. This, these are the ecological pressures we think that lead to this costly and quite elaborate behavior. The other thing, of course, which you are well aware of is that parental care is widespread. So we see parental care in all sorts of animals, right? Um, from you know humans to insects, fish, frogs, birds, everybody's doing it um, because it helps you overcome harsh environments. So this is another reason we think like in the face of also things like climate change, parental care might be um, particularly important because you're a species already set up to like try to help your offspring out when things are not going well. We tend to talk about parental care in sort of three flavors, male uniparental, biparental, and female uniparental. Um, and so there's a few things I wanna point out here. One is, um, that mammals, which is where we do most of our research, are lacking male uniparental care. So once you lactate, it's real hard to get rid of mom. And so this is kind of a problem in the way that we think about parental care because we have a whole thinking about paternal care. And I mean, as humans, I think we on the one hand have an instinct paternal care matters, we also have a strong bias towards thinking of like mom as the main parent, and it's because we're mammals. In fish and frogs, there's actually more male care than female care, which is pretty interesting. And male care evolved first before female care. So that's something people don't know and that I think is pretty cool. And I think shifts the way we like think about our own biases. And then the other thing that is important is that in the frogs, we have closely related species that have these different care strategies or these different flavors of care. And so we think that's exciting because it's a way for us to really think about, well, what's important for any parent or like what's a gene that might matter for any parent, a brain region, and what's specific to being a male or a female or what's specific to being one species or the other. And so kind of by comparing, can we distinguish the signal from the noise and really figure out what's important? All right, this next slide is gonna be a lot to take in, but we're gonna go through it slowly. The other important thing to know is that there are conserved brain regions and molecules that are important for social behavior in all vertebrates. So that's you, 
that's the fish, that's the frogs. So what do I mean by this? Okay, so here is a mammal. This is a vole in this case. These are little sections of brains. Again, the colored blobs are brain regions. That will be a theme throughout the talk. And we know something about brain regions that are important for reward and also for social behavior. And so they're color coded blue and yellow here. And the green blobs, I don't need you to worry about any of the details, except there's blue and there's yellow and there's green where these circuits overlap. And so um, you also will all recognize like social behavior can be rewarding, right? And so these circuits kind of inherently overlap because it should be rewarding that you take care of your children. And so you keep doing that even when on days it's not fun, right? Or we find our interactions with other humans to be rewarding. So these two systems are sort of intimately linked um, in the brain to begin with. And we actually can take these core brain regions and go across all of vertebrates and identify them. So again, without being too concerned about the details, I just want you to see there's blue and green and yellow blobs everywhere. And we actually know, we can say like this region and a human is homologous, is similar to this region and a frog and then a fish and then a bird. And so these regions are evolutionarily ancient and they appear to be quite functionally conserved. So they do similar things across animals. For those of you who recognize some of these words over here, that's great. If you recognize none of these words, I'm only putting this up here to say, not only are these brain regions conserved, we also know there are molecules and genes that are inside of them that are also conserved or that are also shared. Um, so lots of shared things. We know that there is functional overlap here. They're making similar behaviors in some cases, but we also have a lot of holes in our understanding where we just haven't looked. And so when I started as a postdoc, no one had ever looked at what's going on in the brain when frogs or any amphibians for that matter parent. We knew some stuff about mammals and birds and fish, but nothing about frogs. And so the first thing that we wanted to do was to ask, is there a general parental care circuit in the brain? So can we identify brain regions that are important for parental care in our frogs, different species of frogs, and are they the same as in other vertebrates? And so I'm gonna tell you two kind of little stories here, one about tadpole transport, piggyback rides, um, and one about this nursing or egg provisioning behavior. And so coming back to this idea of levels and comparisons, the, the place we're operating, the space we're in is up here thinking about brain regions. And we're gonna take kind of an evolutionary perspective comparing species to get there. All right, so before I do that, I wanna actually show you what this behavior looks like. So this is dad, this is a tadpole on his back. And so he's gonna carry this tadpole around and there's actually water um, there's a hole in this tree and there's water in there. So what he's doing is like sticking his face in there and trying to decide, is this the right place for my tadpole? And in this case, he decides no, and he moves on. Um, and so these animals will actually carry their tadpoles around for hours, sometimes even days. Um, so again, costly behavior, and they are making pretty complex decisions. We also know while they are doing this, right? So this guy just decided this is not the right pool. We're not really sure why, that's something else we're really interested in is how they make these decisions. Oop. Okay, so to get at this question, what we did was that we chose three focal species that have these different care strategies. So male uniparental, biparental, and female uniparental. You can think of them as blue, green, and orange for the rest of this talk. Two of these we had in the lab, or have in the lab, I should say. Um, and so in the lab, we have them in breeding pairs because this lets us ide easily identify both parents, even in the case over here where mom is not usually providing much care. We have them, um, we give them a pond to put tadpoles in, we give them plants, we give them these little coconuts to put their eggs in, um, everything that makes them happy in breeding in our lab. This third species I actually worked on in the field in Ecuador in semi-naturalistic enclosures. Um, and so this was very cool. Part of my job is going to the jungle. That's pretty awesome. Um, but it does mean that in, in these more wild cases, we actually can't identify dad because he's just cruising around, not involved in parental care. So just some kind of pros and cons of doing things in the field in the lab. 
All right. So something people then always ask me is like, okay, how do you look at the brains of frogs? Well, um, we have an assay that we can use to look at neural activity. Okay. So the brain is never on or off. So we're always kind of comparing. And what we're basically asking is like, what parts of the brain light up more when an animal is doing a certain behavior? And so in our case, what we said is, okay, we're going to compare non-parental individuals to tadpole transporting individuals. And so in this case, these would be males because that's the sex that transports. Um, importantly, all of our frogs had parented at some point because experience is also important. We think having been a parent at some point in your life also makes your brain act differently. But what we want to know is, okay, if you're not parenting right now versus actively parenting, what parts of your brain are more and less active? And so what we can do is that we can use these tags, which are antibodies, to grab onto phosphorylated ribosomes. What? Okay. Ribosomes are the places where proteins get made. And so we think that's interesting because when a cell is active, it starts turning on that machinery because it's like, whoa, I need building blocks. I need these proteins. So I know some of you know lots about this and some of you know very little, but the point is this tag basically tells us whether a cell has recently been active. So this all sounds very fancy, but what this actually looks like is that we get images like this where the brown dots represent neurons that have been active recently, where this specific antibody or this tag binds. And then we use this purple tag to just see where every cell is, where the nuclei are. And what, the, so like this sounds all fancy and nice. Basically I spent years of my life like counting brown dots. That was my job um, as a postdoc to get a measure, to use this as a measure of neural activity. And so just to give you a sense of like the massive size of the tissues I'm dealing with here, because it's something people also ask, this is a frog brain and this is a penny. <laughs> and so, right, these brains are pretty tiny. Um, and so this is all happening with some specialized equipment happening under a microscope. And then the other thing that's important is we don't just count like randomly in the brain, we can identify these brain regions. So without worrying about the details again here, what this is is basically a map of the brain. And so these circles that are labeled are the different brain regions. And so I can use this map, which also these different pieces of the map are sort of slices through the brain, like as though it's a loaf of bread um, going from front to back this way. And I can use that map to figure out where I am and to be able to say, okay, I'm gonna look at activity specifically in this brain region and compare it between my individuals. And so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to use this little graphic of a brain. This is now kind of a sideways view um, with these blobs as brain regions. Again, if these words mean something to you. That's excellent. If they don't, don't worry about it. I'm just going to use this to kind of visualize some of the data. All right. So here is this brain with these different brain regions. And the ones that are colored are the ones where we saw differences in activity between parenting individuals and non-parenting individuals. And so this is in this case, our male uniparental species. So this is a dad um, who is doing the tadpole transport. And we see some brain regions where indeed they're like lighting up more during this parental behavior. So I'm gonna add the other species. I love this slide because it took me four years of my life to make this one slide. So science is slow <laughs> and then rapidly summarized. Um, but so again, I want you to just eyeball a metrically assess that some of the blobs that are colored are overlapping between species and some are not. So we see some species and sex specific things happening, but we see some overlap. One of the places we see overlap is this brain region here. It is called the preoptic area. Um, it is part of the hypothalamus, if that is a word you have heard. Um, and this we were super excited about because in every vertebrate where people have looked, so mammals, birds, um, fish, this brain region lights up during parental care. And so we were like, okay, this feels almost like a proof of concept. This is what we expected. We're really pleased about this. The other brain region that was overlapping is this brain region called the medial pallium which is homologous to, um, in mammals, what is called the hippocampus. And so again, some people have probably heard the word hippocampus. 
This is a brain region that is implicated in memory, learning and memory, and specifically spatial memory. And so we didn't necessarily expect this as a brain region important for parental behavior, but um, when we think about the ecology of our animals, we think, well, this actually makes a lot of sense because part of what they're doing when they're parenting is that they're using spatial memory to remember where pools are and to navigate back to them. And so I'm bringing this up because I think this is a neat place where we kind of see one brain region that's like, oh, this makes a ton of sense that like all critters are using this brain region. And then we see one where we're like, oh, this is where there might be some species specificity, some diversity, because what you do when you parent looks a little different if you're a frog versus a mouse. Um, and so this navigational stuff associated with tadpole transport is actually work that um, has been done by my friend and colleague Andreas Pasukonis. And so what Andreas does is that he puts pants on frogs. Um, so these little frog pants that you can see here are actually little tracking devices. And he can use those to track animal movements in great detail around the forest. Um, and has, has demonstrated in that way that indeed they remember where high quality pools are and they're navigating back to them really well across kind of crazy distances when you consider how tiny they are. Um, and then also here um, is Andreas and, and I in the field in French Guiana doing some uh, hardcore field neuroscience. So again, the other thing that I love about my job is that I get to spend time in the lab and I also get to spend time um, in the forest. Okay, so I just told you about tadpole transport and we kind of came to the conclusion, okay, there's some shared brain regions across frogs and some of those are shared with other vertebrates. So now I wanna tell you a little more about maternal provisioning. And so I told you earlier about South American poison frogs. I didn't tell you that there's actually an entirely separate group of poison frogs that have independently evolved these same traits that live on the island of Madagascar off the coast of Africa. And so this we thought was a neat opportunity for us to say, okay, we're gonna think about a different behavior, egg provisioning, and we're gonna zoom out a level of evolutionary comparison. So we're not in this family of South American frogs, we're gonna compare between South American and Malagasy frogs. And so we chose two focal species, um, one of them that we used before in Ecuador, and one in Madagascar, and both of these species have this egg provisioning behavior where they feed their tadpoles. And so we really similar kind of setup, we want to compare what's happening in the brain. And so again, before I show you um, any of the data, I want to show you this behavior. So this is in this case, one of these Ecuadorian frogs, this is mom. And what you will see is that her tadpole is actually begging her for food. So these tadpoles beg, they vibrate along mom, they kind of nibble on her. And this is a really important communication between offspring and parent where the tadpoles are signaling I'm hungry and the mom in the absence of this signal will not lay these eggs, right? And so there's a whole other interesting story about parent offspring communication here, um, which is also quite cool. And then, here is a tadpole, here is an egg, and what you will see, delicious. So this little tadpole is gonna mow down on this egg. Um, some of these species are actually what are called obligate egg feeders. They only eat eggs laid by mom. That is all they survive off of until they metamorphose. They have crazy specialized mouth parts to be able to eat eggs. But in general, right, like eggs are awesome. They're like little protein packets. Um, you know, and so mom is coming to provision them. I will also point out that this is particularly costly because the number of eggs that mom can make is limited. So these species can only keep to the best of our estimates, often like three tadpoles alive at a time, right? So that's a really different strategy from tadpoles you are familiar with from North America that lay like thousands of eggs in some cases. So there's clearly some trade-offs um, as you know, we, again, as humans exemplify between having lots of offspring and then investing a lot more in smaller numbers of offspring. Okay, so what we did was that we took a really similar approach to what I just told you using this tag for neural activity. And so I'm gonna show you the data in the same way. And the main take home here is, aha, once again, we find this brain region, the preoptic area, 
active during this parental behavior. So we've now got the same brain region popping up in multiple behavioral contexts, tadpole transport and nursing, um, in multiple species, including independent evolutionary groups. Cool, we're excited. The other thing that we then started thinking about was like, well, we actually know some stuff about this brain region from other species. And specifically, we know that there's oxytocin neurons in this brain region that are important for nursing behavior. So again, oxytocin is a molecule people have often heard of. It does all sorts of things, but it's commonly implicated in maternal behavior. And again, especially nursing. And again, realizing that nursing in a rat looks pretty different from nursing in a frog. We still were like, well, could evolution still be using the same molecules here? And so frogs don't actually have oxytocin. They have a very closely related molecule called mesotocin. But we wanted to ask, okay, we know this brain region is more active. Is it specifically these mesotocin expressing neurons that are more active? And so what we can do is that we can, again, use a similar technique with antibody tags to um, overlap and ask, like, is this a mesotocin neuron? Is it this cell type we think is important? And is it or is it not active? And we're doing this specifically then in this brain region that we know is important for parental care. Okay, so what did we find? This is the only graph we're going to have. There's going to be no care frogs and nursing moms. And here is basically the activity of these mesotocin cells. Completely opposite patterns in our two species. So in these guys, it seemed like there was more activity when moms were not caring than when they were nursing. And in these guys or gals, we saw less or an increase in activity when they were nursing. So this is kind of like what we expected based on the rats. And this we were like at first sort of disappointed. But while I was initially kind of like, oh man, this like wasn't what I predicted. This wasn't this nice story I was going to tell about everything getting reused. I now actually think this is a really cool pattern because it suggests that you can have the same brain region doing the same thing, but you might be using different molecules inside of that brain region to do it. And so this is where that question of kind of levels also becomes really interesting because if we ask, like, is it the same gene, we might get a really different answer than if we ask, is it the same brain region? And so we think that that's exciting and there's lots of interesting things to look into. All right, I'm going to have a sip of water and then we're going to do some summarizing. So what I just told you, two stories, I talked about um, comparative parental care. So taking these three species, we asked, how are they different? How are they the same? We found some brain regions that are overlapping while they are providing parental care. We also compared that with this maternal care, this nursing behavior in a species that is highly evolutionary diverged, um, that feed their tadpoles. And we again looked at these brains and we again found some overlapping brain regions. A story that I don't really have time to talk about, but I'm happy to babble about later, is that we actually also found that both of these nursing species are using this egg provisioning as a way to provide toxins to their tadpoles. And this we think is really cool because again, with this nursing analogy, as many of you probably know, when mammals nurse, there's all sorts of other goodies in the milk that aren't just food, like things that are important for the immune system. And so here we think this is a cool parallel where it's not just food. They're also able to transmit other goodies like these toxins to sort of help protect their tadpoles um, from predation. Anyway, cool side story. Um, but so then coming back to this question, is there a general parental care circuit in the brain? Yes, it seems like there is. And why do I say this? Well, we see the same brain regions associated with parental care during different behaviors. So nursing and tadpole transport in different frog species. And that also means in different sexes, both moms and dads and in vertebrates more generally. So again, the preoptic area important in every vertebrate we've ever looked at. But we also have some data to suggest there are some different molecules involved. 
And so um, what I've told you so far has been at these kind of higher levels, brain regions using evolutionary comparisons, thinking a little bit about some molecules and cell types. I'm not gonna get into, but we do also have data at some of these other levels. So we've looked at how different genes are expressed and how they're talking to each other. And we kind of get a similar pattern where we see some things that are strongly overlapping and some things that are not as shared. And so to us, part of what then also kind of like this led us to think about is like, okay, so we have similar behaviors often using similar molecules. But we do also have some uniqueness here. And how do we understand how these like both shared and non-shared molecules or cell types or genes give rise to similar behavior like parental care, but also this variation we see across species and variation that we see among individuals. And so kind of a way of saying this is that even mostly shared mechanisms do not produce uniform behavior. We still have variation between species um, and within species. And so that's kind of part of where we're at now is thinking about how variation within and between species is related and where it comes from. And so this is a place that I want to make a point that I think is pretty important, which is that especially mechanistic studies, so especially studies that think about neurobiology and brains, um, tend to treat individual differences as noise. So often what they're doing is they're saying, well, there's a blue group and a red group, and we really want to know, like, how are those groups different? But these little dots represent the individuals. And so what you can see is that there's actually a lot of variation within those groups. And this individual variation is actually really important from an evolutionary perspective because that's what natural selection acts on. And so that's how evolution proceeds. And to put this kind of in a context of like, well, why should we care about this? Well, if we think about how animals are adapting to changing environments, having variation within a species means that some might be able to survive and pass on those traits. And so that's what could fuel adaptation to warmer climates, for example. Another way we can think about this, um, disease resistance, right? COVID on everybody's mind. Some people are more resistant to this disease than others. And why is that? And this is also happening at the level of individual variation. And so usually, right, we're ignoring this individual variation. We're thinking about the mean. And that also means that things get weird in places like medicine, where when they're dosing you for a drug, they're thinking about the mean in the population. And like, what if you're this guy, right? So there's lots of places that individual variation actually really matters, including in parental behavior. So here are two moms. These are pups of these mice. And as you can see, there is some clear differences here in um, the strategy that these moms are using with their pups, right? So we have like a very protective, attentive mother, and then we have a mom who is just not doing a good job. And so this is something we know generally that there is individual variation in parental behavior. And we also know that this really matters for outcomes for offspring. And something that is, I think, pretty interesting in, in also some species is that we know that if you get parented like this, you will end up parenting like this later on. So not only do these behaviors have consequences for the offspring, they also basically have consequences for like the grandchildren, if you will. And this is true in human populations as well. And so given that we're now thinking about all this individual variation, um, I am very lucky to have an amazing postdoc, Dr. Sarah Westrick, who is really particularly interested in this question and who um, was the first person to join my lab. She took a big leap of faith here. Um, and she is trying to answer this question, do dads show consistent variation? So can we get at this question of individual variation and what can it teach us? And this is quite a tour de force, people. So what Sarah has done is that she has set up this video monitoring system. So what we have here, this is a tank. We're looking at our, one of our tanks from above. There's a pool. This is where these guys will put their tadpoles. There are these coconut condos, which is where they lay their eggs. Um, and then what you will see here is at four times speed, dad coming out of a cocoa condo, he's got a tadpole on his back and he's scoping it out. So I think it's also cool to see that the video I showed you earlier in the field, they're doing something very similar in the lab. Um, and eventually, come on, buddy, here he goes, boop, he's going to get in that water and drop off his tadpole. 
Um, and so what, whoop, there we go. So Sarah, um, has a bunch of pairs set up. She is doing daily checks for survival, hatching and transport. Um, so here, this is also, I think neat to see, this is what eggs look like really early on. And then we can see these tadpoles developing, getting larger and eventually hatching. And once they hatch, um, dad will transport them. Um, and so she has set up a whole video array. And currently Sarah has nine individuals, 26 clutches, 3000 hours of video, which is over nine terabytes of data. And so I'm also showing you this um, so that, you know, you can be like, wow, you're cruel and unusual, poor Sarah. Um, but really to point out, this is why people don't look at individual variation either, is that it is hard and it is a lot of work, but we think it is really important. And so I wanna show you a little bit of Sarah's really awesome data that's starting to come out that I think speaks to this. Okay, so here, you're probably not used to looking at these kinds of plots, but we have days across the x-axis, and this is the probability that tadpoles are gonna get transported. So um, it's basically a survival curve, who's gonna make it? And something that I wanna point out here is that there's a median 23 days. Okay, sure, if you read the literature, it says that's about how long it takes to for tadpoles to hatch and get transported but we actually see a 20 day range in when dads transport. And this is crazy because this is double. This is given how long this takes, given the median is 23 days, having a 20 day range is huge, right? From the perspective of the percentage of time. Um, and so this is again, like a demonstration of individual variation that we weren't really aware of and that is massive and that probably matters. And so if we look at these different dads, so now I've got every dad as a different color, we can see there is variation between individuals hidden in here as well. And so I'm gonna show you this in a different way. So now we've got tadpole transport still along the X axis. We've got individual frogs on the Y. And so what you can notice is like this orange dad here always transports sooner than for example, this blue dad over here. But there's also variation within these dads in terms of how long it takes them. So, right, there is lots of variation here. We find this interesting. And we also are building a data set that we hope is going to let us get at the question of like, what are the consequences of this variation for the tadpoles? So are there good and bad dads, basically, is somewhat the question. But we're definitely seeing that there is variation and that dads are internally consistent. So they seem to have like a different parenting style, if you will. So stay tuned for more to come. And then the last thing I want to say is that this video system has also been amazing because we've been able to see some really cool rare events. So here um, is a tadpole in the pond. Here is dad with a tadpole on his back. And here is mom with a tadpole on her back. And so we're also seeing that there is some variation within the species, some flexibility in this parental behavior um, that is also not super well appreciated. So we think of this species as male uniparental, turns out sometimes mom takes over. Um, and so this is something else we're super interested in, like why does this happen? Um, when do mom moms take over? Um, and then also how this takeover behavior might lead to some changes at longer evolutionary timescales. Alrighty, to zoom way back out and wrap it up so that we can leave also time for questions. Does evolution reuse the same building blocks? This is where I started. Yes, absolutely. We have evidence for this in lots of places, but not always. Right, so there is variation and I've also showed you that. Okay, so what, right? Um, so if you take nothing else from this talk, what I want you to walk away with is, well, frogs are cool, that part's obvious, but also that comparative research is powerful and important. So what do I mean by this? Well, evolution reuses the same building blocks, but not always. Um, to give you a couple of examples of why then doing comparative research, research that looks at different kinds of animals and different kinds of contexts. Um, one is that a lot of what we do is, or a lot of what people do, especially in the biomedical field is in mice. And so what we're basically assuming is like mice are tiny humans. And this works pretty well for a lot of things. 
Um, but it doesn't always. And so as one kind of recent example that maybe people heard about in the news um, is that there are some studies looking at Alzheimer's drugs. They work great in mice. It's amazing, like totally game changing. The mice improve a ton. And then we take them into humans and they don't work very well. And it's like, why? Well, maybe because when we just compare two species, we can't tell, are we targeting something that is one of these like core mechanisms that's really shared across all sorts of vertebrates, making it a really good target for translational medicine? Or are we actually targeting something that's super mouse specific? And so I think that doing comparative research is what lets us distinguish that signal to noise. What lets us say like, is this something that's broadly shared across animals? Or is this something that is leading to the species specificity and diversity that we know also exists. And in the context specifically of our frogs, um, I mentioned, right, paternal care is not super well understood because mammals don't do it. Our frogs do have paternal care. Um, they also have maternal care. And something else that's cool is that tadpole transport actually looks really similar. So we think it's a good place to try to understand what gives rise to sex differences in the brain, because this is actually something we also don't understand very well, um, or rather I should say sex differences in behavior. They're ubiquitous across animals, but brains actually look really, really similar between males and females. And so how do you get like, right, again, like how does a similar looking brain give rise to really different behaviors? And so we think the frogs are cool for something like that as well. And then finally, something I didn't talk about is that some of these tadpoles are highly aggressive. And so this is, again, an interesting situation where in most of the animals we regularly use in a lab environment, the juveniles are not aggressive. But we know that aggression in human populations among kids, for example, is really important and of clinical interest. And so how are we going to understand what's happening in the brain if we don't have a good model for it? And so by looking outside of traditional models, we can find animals um, that do things that are unique and we can capitalize on that. Okay. So just to like really summarize this then in a really broad way, um, we need diversity, right? And I think we need that diversity in the way we do research to answer the science questions. But I think the other thing that, you know, I haven't really talked about, but I firmly believe is that we also need diversity in our research spaces and in our classrooms and just like generally in our lives, like we need it in nature um, for things to function well. And so if you take nothing else from this talk, I hope that, um, I will leave you with that thought. And so with that, um, I want to say thank you to everyone who is here for your attention um, and I'm happy to answer questions. Awesome, thank you so much for your talk. It was really cool. I love seeing all the frog pictures, they're amazing. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or put them in the chat, whatever you want. Um, yeah. I also, if people don't have questions, I'm just going to show you more pictures of frogs, so don't worry about it. I will also say there's lots of stuff happening in the lab that I didn't really get to talk about. So these guys right here, if you have no other questions, you should be asking what is happening with these frogs. Um, so these are glass frogs, which someone else, um, one of my graduate students is really interested in, and they are called glass frogs because they are totally see-through. So we can see their organs through here. Um, they also pro provide parental care. Um, so yeah, these guys also very cool. I have a question. Hey, Pamela, thanks for coming. Hello, very interesting. Um, so I have a question about the, the individual variability. Yeah. Well, this might be a scientific question, but I think uh, it's also kind of intuitive. So if you, if you go back to the analysis that Sarah did and, and have those um, error bars that are kind of sideways, Mm -hmm. um, it seems that the, the individuals are kind of homogeneal, homogeneously dispersed across the time, and that time has a direct effect on the survival, the number of frogs that survive. Um, well, so that was not survival, it was probability of transport. So they be oh. it's like, so as time goes on, the probability that you will be transported decreases. 
No, so we also that's... we do have survival curves, and it is true that like once you hatch, there is some window in which you can survive, and then eventually you dry out. I'm thinking on the other plot in which it says frogs by that. Okay, hang on. Or... You go back. Frogs by that. It has the those bar plots that are similar. yeah yeah you know what you're talking about. So I'm just curious because, but maybe I didn't I didn't get that plot well, and that might, that might answer my question too. This um, one, this one. So I I was kind of surprised to see how like the variation was so homogeneous across the. Um, number of days and frogs by that. Like, I wonder, let me see how I frame this word, uh, this question. I would expect to see more frogs by that in less days. Will that be accurate? Sorry, more, say that one more like time. Like, higher number in the y axis. Also, the y axis is inverted. Maybe that's why I got confused. Higher number in the y axis and lower days in the x axis. Oh, so the y axis is just every one of these is an individual dad. And these are the individual data points are different times that he carried a tadpole. I see. So these are just, okay, that makes so sense. So, like this dad, one of his tadpoles, he carried it like what? 16 days, one at 17, one at 18, one at 19. Whereas this guy waited all the way until like 32 to carry one of his tadpoles. So the y-axis, let me see what Sarah said. It's just an individual frog ID. Okay, that's why I got confused. Thank yeah. you. Because I was thinking that that was the number of frogs that will kind of... Yeah, Sarah, think. also feel free to unmute yourself because it's all Sarah's data that I showed you. And she made those graphs. This is the beauty of being a PI. I'm superfluous. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. I guess I was what I was thinking is like the longer it takes for the dad, the less survival they have, the survival probability or the number of frogs that will make it will be reduced. So I was curious because evolutionary speaking, you might select to the opposite trend mm -hmm. to have like more survival. Yeah. So but I guess now that I know that that is not actually the numbers of frogs that made it, <laughs> that makes more sense. sense. Yeah. Sarah, do you want to speak to that at all? Um, yeah, I, I think the wax is because it said frog by dad. It just meant mm -hmm. like frog or dad you can use either word. Um, but yeah, okay. the, the, you could some individuals will transport quite late and some will transport a little bit earlier. And we see that variation in hatching time as well. Um, but there's also variation in how quickly after they hatch, they're going to transport as well. So um, but that, that variation is not necessarily associated with survival. Um, not necessarily because some okay. of the eggs don't even survive to hatch. Um, that so that, that's something where I'm looking into more as we kind of get more fine scale data. Perfect. Yeah. But we've been like shocked at how much variation there is also in like, sometimes they're hatched and they're like hanging out for so long. It's been really like surprising. And so I think this is where like Sarah has done so much work, but I think that the things we are seeing are like really quite surprising and make me feel like, wow, like people make a lot of assumptions that are not right about like how much variation there is. Yeah, no, very cool. Thank you. I guess that answered my question because I thought there was an association between the timing and survival. And I was like, wow, that could have been erased by evolution already, but if there isn't that thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, on that, I had an interesting, or I had a question that popped up that could be, I think, logistically maybe very hard to measure. But like, yeah, you, you said that with some of the other things, like how you were parented affects how you parent. So, is there any way to tell if how late the frogs are transporting is hereditary or based on? Yeah. So we're super 
excited that um, we, so the other thing Sarah has done is that she built a giant database, which we call Frogbook, and we are tracking all sorts of things. And so my other graduate student, Lisa, which I didn't have time to talk about her really lovely work, she's looking at the tadpoles. And she has been looking at how they differ in aggressive behavior and development and survival and all these things. And so we haven't done it yet, but once we connect these dots, we're hoping we're going to be able to ask things like, you know, if you are a late transporting dad, does that have an influence on the survival of your offspring, on the behavior of your offspring? Um, and so that's, I mean, that's like kind of where we're going, but we're, we're not there yet. Very cool. And there we were was, running up against time, but yeah, there were a couple other questions that came up in the chat. Oh, one was uh, for young frogs that don't get toxins from their parents. Does the coloration help them fake it till they make it? Oh, great question. Yeah. So I didn't. So they're not toxic in the lab because we don't feed them the right stuff and they're still brightly colored. So that is like an excellent question, right? It probably helps you fake it till you make it. Um, but at a, like a longer time scale, the idea is that the predators have to learn that they don't taste good. And so if you start eating them and they taste just fine, then right, that that like avoidance of the frogs would wear off. But yeah, they do also get their colors before they metamorphose. Like we start to see it late in the um, in development. So presumably that is like what's then happening. They hatch out looking brightly colored and fake it till they make it. I love that. I'm going to start the, going to adopt the terminology. And I think that answers the other question, which is that the frogs in the lab aren't fed their yeah. usual diets. Yeah. Yeah. So they're not toxic in the lab, um, which people always ask me because, you know, like, are you going to poison yourself? Um, but we can, something that's cool is that we can actually make them toxic in the lab. So these frogs, what is also quite cool is that they actually have tens to hundreds of different toxins, different compounds. Um, so in the wild, it's very complex and there's lots of them, which is very cool. And there's geographic variation and individual variation, and it's super interesting. But in the lab, we can actually order some of these commercially. So it's only one or two that are available, but we can then make them toxic. And so, um, you know, other things we think about is like, how does your behavior change if you're toxic versus not? And we haven't tested that, but we think it would be really cool. Awesome. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I'm sure people are wanting to get to dinner. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for coming, uh, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your amazing talk. Thanks.